Peace, peace, peace. Trying to see something real quick. Let me invite my guest in. Peace, peace, peace. Trying to see something real quick. They blocked me on my other page from going live. Let's see. Trying to see something real quick. <clears throat> yeah, man, they blocked me from going live on my other page. All right, peace, peace, beloved. Peace, how are you? <laughs> oh man, so okay, so this works. Yes. Unfortunately, all right. Let me see. Let me get my audio together. Yeah, and I'm going to um, go ahead and direct my followers to this account. What's up, everybody? Yes. We we both realized at the last minute that we're both right, blind. right. I didn't even know that. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, and it's funny to me because. I haven't really even been putting up anything that controversial, you know. So the right. the um yeah, the, me neither is 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 very prominent right now. So let me see yeah, how that was. This. That was a shock, but the the show must go on. Yes, for sure, and it ain't they ain't stopping nothing. Just get get creative and find new ways, you know. Right. Okay. So right. Let, I need to share this live with my audience. Let me see. Yes. Mm. Let me see. Copy profile link. Okay. And then this is crazy. <laughs> DTR books. So let me find a flyer and I will share the story. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> DTR books, so let me find the flyer and uh, share the story. This is crazy. Yeah, how, <laughs> how you just shared it? Books, um, so let me find the flyer and uh, share the story. Feedback. I know, I hear it. This is crazy. Because yeah. I'm on my other phone. I right, just bear with us, family. We we trying to get everything situated. Just bear with us. We're gonna start soon. Making sure my audio and everything.
Okay, yeah, I think that's right. All right, family, you are in for a treat. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. Let me uh, put the caption up. Peace, Leah. How you doing, Queen? That's my sister from Oakland, and uh, I see her okay. in the chat room. What's good, y'all? You remember me, right? Remind me. <laughs> so, so um, I, I know it has. From from Brooklyn. From Nicholas Books. Like, Yes, correct. Yes. I do remember. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm like, I'm, I wonder if this sister remember me. Yeah, it's been, it's been, that was what, maybe four or five years ago? Yeah, like around 2015, 2016. Yeah, that was, that was a long time ago. Right. But yeah, I, I need to um, get back up to Brooklyn soon, maybe this summer, um, and come to speak at um, Nicholas. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to talk to you to see if, like, if you were still um, doing uh, events because uh, yeah, I want to, um, you know, throw an event and have you speak at one. I am. You know, they just got to be, uh, you know, catered in a certain type of way. I'm not with the whole mask program, you know what I mean, right. type of stuff, you know. So as long as this and, – and then also, um, you know, I just feel like we got to be – take a, a few extra steps now in doing public events. You know what I mean? Um, for me, for one, I have stalkers, unfortunately. Um, but oh, man. like, you know, it's just, we're living in some times right now where I feel like, you know, we have to be careful with the people that we allow into our space, personal or otherwise, you know? Indeed. So that would be my, you know, my requirements, the upfront requirements, you know? Mm. Okay. Okay. Definitely. Um, we can, talk more about it offline and, yes uh you know see if we can get something together for our new jersey and brooklyn peeps yes you know 2022 oh that's tuning in i'm gonna be your co-host for a second here we uh we both tried to go live from our main channels and we're both blocked from going live so luckily this bro this brother has the you know the the fortitude to have a backup a backup page. Mm -hmm. um so that we can come together live and even if you know if anything happened with this i mean i have a website my my website does everything you know? yeah, yeah, yeah i've seen it yeah I, I, I right com. my site um you know they 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 you know they'll be they'll be limited in them being able to censor us so it's all good right and and, and i see um that i must commend you on um you wrote other books but except for two are on amazon and your other four yeah. Or not. Yeah. So I said, oh, she probably did that like for spite. Like it's intentional. Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, it cost me a lot more money to print the web the workbooks. So it wouldn't be cost it wouldn't be efficient, you know, as far as financially to have them on Amazon because they take a certain percentage, as you exactly. know. Exactly. Um, so I wouldn't get I, I'd probably get pennies on the dollar when it, you know, because right. I a lot more to get those books printed so and then you know i mean my website you know people have to start going out of their way to finding the people that are in alignment with with you know the message that, that they want to hear you know so mm -hmm. even with the situation with both of us kind of being censored like yeah we need you guys to take extra steps to come to our pages and see when we post new content to comment on the post and also to share them you can't even tag my name right now right you know? yeah i've seen it Somebody that follows me like yeah when you think about me take some time to go to my page and not just see what i post but actually comment and share exactly <laughs> exactly right right so yes that being said family definitely share share this live share this live make sure that it gets out to as much people as possible because when i tell you this is going to be a high level conversation this will be a high level conversation with many gems dropping with so much wisdom uh, from this informative um, interview alone. So definitely share this live and get your pen and paper ready. Definitely get your pen and paper ready. Take notes uh, because it's not only good to just hear the information, but apply the information. Our motto is always apply knowledge is true power. So definitely you want to take in the information and you want to obtain it. But the next step is to carry out that information, execute, implement, 
and apply the information so that you can so that it can benefit you and your family. Yeah. All right. So with that being said, let's uh let's get into it. I'm going to play my intro real quick and then I will introduce you. Fix my audio. CR 360 Books Podcast. CR 360 Books. We're helping to increase reading literacy. We are here to create more doers and less talkers. This is where we execute the knowledge and put it into action. Enjoy this week's episode of the podcast. What's going on, family? Assalamu alaikum, shalom, shalom, hotep, Islam, alafia, peace. Happy Monday, happy Monday. Yes, we made it another week. We made it to another week. Happy Monday to all and to all a happy Monday. Man, when I tell you I am excited, I am delighted, elated, all of those words here this evening uh, because we have a very, very special guest in the house. Um, this lady... This sister, I mean, she she will blow your head off, and I mean that in a good way, all right? So definitely bring out your pen and paper and get ready to take notes. Get ready to apply the knowledge that this sister is about to bestow upon you here tonight. So before we get started and I introduce the sister, please, please, please make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, DTR360 Books. Uh, just before uh, I try to go, I try to log on and go live on my main page. I was censored and I couldn't go live for whatever reason. DTR three sixty books with two underscores. So I'm currently going live on my backup page. So definitely make sure that you support as many platforms as DTR three sixty books is on, just in case my main page, which has currently over. Uh, 86, uh, uh, 68,000 followers and counting. All right. So definitely support our various platforms, uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Um, I'm even on TikTok. All right. With over 25,000 followers. Um, so yes, definitely, uh, support the brand, support the platform, um, and also support the podcast as well. Support the podcast. All right. We are on Google Podcasts. Um, uh, Stitcher, uh, uh, iHeartRadio, and other uh, podcast platforms as well. All right, so without further ado, uh, this sister, man, uh, this sister is uh, a mother. Uh, she's a sister. Uh, she's an entrepreneur. Uh, she's an activist. She's a businesswoman. Um, need I go on? I mean, <laughs> she's, you know, everything, and, and she's for our people. Right. Uh, and um, so, I, as I said earlier, I'm excited and I present to you no other than Sister Zaza Ali. Welcome, beloved. Thank you so much for having me and peace and love to everyone in the audience. Um, I'm happy to be here in spite of, you know, they're trying to get in our way. But, you know, like I always say, you can't cancel God. You know what I mean? So we find a way we do what has to be done. Exactly, exactly. And this information will be uploaded on uh, various platforms as well. So look out for this interview um, on YouTube, um, on, as I said earlier, on the podcast platforms as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, tell us about your background, sister, and uh, what was your upbringing like? Well, I am originally from Oakland, California. I was born and raised in Oakland. Um, that's pretty much would probably be my, you know, my foundation, so to speak, for my um, cultural, you know, cultured perspective um, and my outlook on the world, so to speak. Um, I lived in Oklahoma for two years when I was in high school. I've lived in Atlanta. Um, I lived in Dallas for a short amount of time when I was in college. Um, but Oakland was pretty much, you know, the place that raised me, so to speak. I live in Los Angeles now. 
um, which is where I am. Um, but that's that was my upbringing. Um, my father put me in a all black African centered private school uh, when I was in pri uh, preschool. So from preschool up until fifth grade, um, I was kind of raised in an incubator. The school's called Hope Academy. It's in Oakland, right off of MacArthur Boulevard. Um, and so that was also very instrumental in my love for my people. Um, and I think that's really where my love for history um, kind of got sparked. So, you know, and I know we're going to talk about history, so that's relative. Right. But, um, you know, being in Oakland and kind of seeing the two different paradigms, um, you know, part of Oakland was a very strong, powerful black, you know, liberal and only liberal you know, liberal today means something different, right? Um, mm. Liberal in the sense that it was, you know, that kind of Berkeley hippie element, uh, you know, obviously the Black Panthers, the Nation of Islam had a very strong uh, position there. So, you know, I think it was all of those things that kind of, you know, accultured who I've become today. Uh, so that was probably, you know, my upbringing, my background, not probably, that's my background. Um, and that's how I got to where I am today. That's the mm. exception, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so did you see any, um, uh, I, I would sense that you seen um, discrimination, um, possibly segregation uh, and racism while growing up in Oakland. Uh, if you could talk about that, um, how, how is that like and how did that shape your perception of quote unquote white supremacy? No. <laughs> oh, you did it. Okay. Because, yeah, only because, and I'm, I'm going to qualify that, but you know, it took me really going down south and going to Atlanta. And I used to go to, my family's from Beaumont, Texas, so I used to go to Beaumont during the summers. Um, but it really took me to go down south to really, you know, be confronted face to face, like with that obvious blatant racism. Um, I think white people and black people in California have an understanding, <laughs> you know what okay. I mean? So a lot of the blatant things that you see um, in other part of the countries, I just didn't grow up seeing. There were subtle things, you know, if we went to San Francisco um, and went in certain stores, you know, uh, Bloomingdale's and things like that, you might get somebody, you know, eyeing you sideways. But in Oakland, I didn't really deal with a lot of racism direct um now obviously because it was such a um you know kind of polarizing city and you know uh revolutionary city you know with the with the panthers in the backdrop um conversations of race were always looming right we had police brutality we had black men getting shot by the police officers we always had that that element that you find everywhere else but as far as me directly it just i just never you know had to deal with direct uh, confrontation of racism, so to speak. I had experiences, you know, later on in life. Um, now, you know, Oakland is so gentrified. Um, if you go around Lake Merritt, you know, <laughs> is there's no telling what you're going to be confronted with. I think the, um, you know, the European, the the, the gentrified version of, of Oakland is a lot more bold in terms of how, you know, um, white people interact with blacks in Oakland. Um, but I didn't grow up in that Oakland. So, you know, it, it was the indirect racism. It was, you know, the, the crack cocaine, right? So right. let me let me roll that back because I'll say directly, nobody called me a, uh, right. the N-word growing up, right? But also they flooded my city with crack cocaine, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I watched it go from, you know, Mayor Elihu Harris was a black mayor. We had a predominantly black governmental system in Oakland and, you know, it, I watched it go from that to, you know, everybody kind of being in a war zone, living in a war zone and being afraid in their own homes, right? So the, the initial, we would look at each other and see, uh, you know, the crackheads as the enemy, right? Or the drug dealers as the enemy or right. the block boys as the enemy. But in the bigger scheme of things, and this was why I wrote the scientific intervention in our affairs, yeah, these people were actually studying and trying to figure out how to bring cheap drugs into black communities in order to nullify and neutralize us, right? So that's the indirect, you know, racism, white supremacy that, that I experienced in Oakland. Okay, mm -hmm. very well. So um, what got you into consciousness? 
what got you into, you know, wanting to fight for Black people's rights, wanting to stand up and be a voice for the voiceless? Well, it was all of that backdrop, right? Everything that I just talked about um, in terms of Oakland, you know, the Black Panthers, the nation is, of Islam was a very strong, had a very strong position in Oakland, right? So the places that we went to go eat, that we went to go buy books, you know, these were places of high, you know, levels of Black consciousness, Black books, Black resources. Um, so it was those things. Definitely when I was in high school, I fell in love with history. Um, in the ninth grade, I had a black uh, high school, a black uh, history teacher. She was a sister, and um, it was at Tennyson High School in Hayward, California. And you know that was when I really fell in love with African history. And so I just mm -hmm. started to devour, you know, find resources, find information, find content, and just really kind of soak it up. Um, the comedic period of history was very important for me. Um, the Kandakis, the African Queens, that was a very important time frame. And I think the 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 Moors in Spain is probably my favorite. Um, just okay. because I love, you know, I love architecture. So right. you know, that whole, the grandeur of the architecture of that time period. But I would say history was definitely when that first, first light went off. Um, and then, you know, later I started studying the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. I started reading about, you know, different scholars and other cultures and things. And so all of those things just kind of, you know, propelled me towards consciousness, if you will. Right, right. And I, I like that you're, you're very um, um, vast and, and, and wide in different areas of, of history. Thank you. Um, you know, m most times when, uh, you know, a speaker speaks, he or she is just... Um, has an expertise in, you know, the Moors in Spain, or has just has an expertise in comedic spirituality, comedic history, and they tend to shun other uh, periods or eras of history, That's and uh, you know, not really tend to read up on or even become an expertise on those areas mm -hmm. of uh, of history. Yes, uh, because uh, just like. Um, Baba Kaba. Uh, Baba Kaba once said that um, Moorish history is African history. Yes. So you, you, you can't speak on Moorish history without speaking on African history. It's yeah. one in the same. Yes. Um, and, and so uh, speaking of um, Moorish uh, history, uh, if, if you can explain uh, how the Moors are simply us, we mm -hmm. are Moors. Yeah. Well, but we have lost our identity, of course. Yes, we have. And, you know, and even just a, a, you know, side note, like, I think all of the, the arguing that's still going on, like, yeah. like, we're still holding full fledged debates about certain periods in history. Like, I get it. I understand. I'm an intellectual. I love history. So I was in that place at one point in time. But in this hour, I think, especially for our, our men and those of us that are, you know, beyond like that 25 age range, um, our time would be a lot better served focusing on things that we really need to be focusing on now. But um, so Ivan Van Sertema is really my favorite history teacher, right? So Ivan okay. Van was in all over Africa, but he was also talking about, you know, the, the indigenous people of the Americas, right? And how Africans had come to America, you know, way before Christopher Columbus. Um, he also talked about the, the Moors, right? So I think that Ivan Van Sertema, for me, I saw him kind of stretch out beyond the, the, the particulars that most people were, you know, Cheikh Ansadiyap is another one of my favorite scholars, but he pretty much specializes in a certain uh, uh, time period and in certain areas of Africa, right? Ivan Van Sertema was all over the place, um, which I think that was important for me. But, you know, if you look at the original Arabs, the indigenous Arabs, original Arabs, they are blacker than you, <laughs> skin yeah. white, right? right. right. And so when I started to see that, and then I, you know, at a certain point, I would be looking into Iranian culture. Those original people were jet black people. Then I started looking at Turkish, Turkish culture. Right. You know, people were jet black people. Then Ooh. I had Japanese culture. Those people were jet black people. The natives, yes. 
Titans. Those people were probably not jet black, but very have very dark skin, right? So everywhere you look around the world, if once you get into the, the real true history that's not Europeanized, there are black people everywhere, right? So now there's the argument, you know, Cheikh Atadiyev said there was a two cradle, two cradles. He had a two cradle theory, not just that the original people came out of Africa, but that there was actually another cradle of civilization, which is how all of the people of the world spread out into different places, right? Then we have the, you know, out of Africa, people migrated up into up to Europe. They took on different phenotypes, you know, started looking a different type of way. Then they crossed the Barren Straits and came to America, right? So there's all these different kind of caveats as to how we became who we are today. But the original Arabs, even the Arabs of today, and I remember clearly when, uh, what country was that? It was, I want to say it was the Congo, when they had that big, uh, you know, public, uh, there was a war between the North and the South, right? Was it the Ooh. Congo? I'm pretty sure it was the Congo. It was the Arabs versus the Africans. And okay. so we started to have the peace talks you had the Arabs on this side and the Africans on this side. Black here, black there. You literally right. could not tell them from one another, apart from one another, besides the clothing that they were wearing, right? Or when they mm -hmm. actually spoke, because these people were speaking Arabic and these were people were speaking the native tongue, right? So when I looked at that, I just really, uh, you know, and especially when you understand, like, you know, get it, start getting into the deeper metaphysics of how the racist came to be, right? To me, our people were everywhere. You know what I mean? We're, we've been everywhere across this country. All of the original, you know, sciences and mathematics and great, you know, kind of philosophies were started with us. So for me, once I started to realize that there were Black Arabs and then obviously Black Africans, mm -hmm. Sounds like a you know a misnomer, but a conversation. Everybody knows what I'm saying. Um, these darker skinned people from all over the world. Are we infighting? Sure. Are there problems between Africans and Arabs? Absolutely. Were Arabs uh, responsible for aspects of the slave trade? Yes. So were Africans, right? So, so in understanding that, what I do know is that Black Arabs never went around the world and enslaved the world. Right. Africans never went around the world and enslaved the world, right? Black right. Iranians, black people from, you know, the Americas, you know, Africa's descendants of Africans, we've never been the ones to be the aggressors on our planet, right? We've all been kind of fighting with each other and having problems amongst one another as a result of colonization and imperialism and all of these different things, right? So to me, I, I feel like melanated people from all over the world, um, descendants of Africa from all over the world, really need to understand that wherever you go, wherever there is land, there's black people. Now, mm -hmm. can we, you know, the native people, the indigenous people from the Americas don't say they're from Africa. They say they're original to this land, right? There's, we're still arguing about those things. I used to, I don't anymore, right? Because again, we, if we outnumber, or I shouldn't say outnumber, we are the majority of people on this planet talking about indigenous descendants of Africa. We've got to get out of the posture of being tenants on our planet and get back into the mindset of being landlords, which is what we, were all, we always were during history, right? So I think that just directly to your question, that, that, com that conversation about the Arabs the the moors versus the uh well not the moors versus but you know were they africans or were they arabs they were both but they right. were still black people right and i think you know we gotta even even egypt now you know um not only do most people think that egypt is separate from africa or that somehow egypt you know represented these lighter skinned arab arab people <clears throat> they also don't understand that you know What's, if you go to Egypt right now, the representation of reflects the people that are there now. Right. What they represent, what they give the most, you know, uh, 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 there's a guy, I forget his name. I used to be researching him. He was one of the main, you know, collectors and the, the, the artifact. He was going and studying and researching all of the artifacts. He's this white Arab guy. And he wouldn't give the Africans any credit for comedic history, right? So that's mm -hmm. another 
caveat, depending on who you talk to, you really will think that 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 land was, you know, um, built and harbored by, you know, non-black people. But the writing is clearly on the wall. And if you go down to Nubia and down to the the the, the um, uh, there's an area, um, the Mer where the where the Meroe Dam is, it's in the Nubia area. I mean, the the pyramids, the statues, the architecture, everything represents full. 100% African phenotypes. Nice. So for me, just as far as history is concerned, like us continuing to argue the semantics is not powerful. I'm getting ready to write a history textbook, right? So I'm going to give the, it's called Ancient People, a social studies and history textbook. That's what's up. There's nothing for else to argue at this point. You know right. what I mean? I know those people were African. You know, right. our, about it takes from the the the, the power and the, the the importance of those historical times to me, you know. Oh man, wonderful, wonderful man! What a profound answer. Um, yeah, and I, I can't wait for that textbook uh, to come out because um, we need it. Yes, uh, we need it. Uh, so, uh, staying on the topic of like um, African. Um, and the uh, African so social, African family structure. Um, you know, uh, ancient Africans, our ancestors, uh, they had gender roles, right? The males would do this, the women would do that, the kids would do thus and so. Um, in today's time, do you believe in gender roles? Why or why not? Well, you know, scientifically uh and just the way you know talk about our physical makeup you know science gives us gender roles right so i have a son my son i obviously gave birth right my body my whole entire body you know and i realized this this through the pregnancy process before you know giving birth to my before i gave birth to my son after and during the whole pregnancy process the woman's body is 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 you know, created to um, give life, right? And not only, not only to give life, but sustain life. Yes, it was Zahi Hawass. Thank you very much. Somebody in the comments was talking about the, it's this Egyptian Arab dude that has been very heavily involved in trying to, you know, Europeanize or at least Arabize African culture. So thank mm. you. But, um, so yeah, our bodies, you know, have already kind of stipulated that there's gender roles, if you will. Um, you know, men are more physically um, dominant in terms of the way that your bodies are, you know, made. So yes, that is a gender role per se. Um, and because the woman is this, the first teacher and the first nurturer to the child, naturally she's going to be the one to implement, you know, the nurturing, um, the household elements, which I don't have a problem with any of those things. I don't think for us to have a conversation and say, you know, well, it's, it's up to the woman to make sure that the, the children are getting proper nutrition and proper, you know, uh, homeschooling or whatever that is. Like, you know, I see all these feminist conversations that have right. to do with that. It's like, that's because you don't know the power of being a woman. If mm. for to have the position of being the first teacher of both sexes, right? So baby boy, baby girl, doesn't matter. Here I am, mom on the scene. Right. And that daughter and that son, they, they will eventually grow up to be men and women. Right. So I don't have an issue with that. I don't have an issue with cooking. I don't have like I don't know why there's this new kickback kind. Well, I know why it's it's multilayered. Um, so, yeah, I think there, as far as those things, absolutely. Now, I think where we start to get things misconstrued and I've also found this in African culture um and and i say that understanding that you know africans have been first of all it's not one group right it's not one you know when i say africans i understand that there it's multi-layered multi-cultural right. tribes um <clears throat> but we also have to remember that africa was colonized right right so there are things that are taking place in our culture that are not necessarily original to the way that we originally operated right yeah. so from that vantage point, um, you know, I think that there is this thing now where we've been convinced or we've convinced ourselves that men are the superior sex, men are the superior gender, right? And and so when we 
talk about these things, we have to kind of like unpack some things because we really do believe that. Men, men believe that and women believe that. And it's reinforced in religion. It's reinforced in history. I mean, you look at Hubshetzit, who is my favorite historical figure. The men of that time gave her hell. You know mm. what I'm saying? That was before the white man came in, right? That was the one who uh, dressed up as a man? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, they she were had a bed and everything, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And even like yeah. that, that, it's funny because you know, that everybody's like, Well, did she have a man? Was she married? Like that, that's that, that somehow lessens her impact, right? And now, today, I find myself constantly answering that same question, like, Oh, you're not in a relationship, which people don't even know, um, or but somehow trying to minimize me, right? Um, so I think that, you know, the world has convinced all of us that the woman is the lesser sex, which I 100% wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly disagree with. Um, so I think that the gender roles, absolutely, our bodies naturally say it, the way we're wired naturally say it, says it, the, the fact that women are more kind of emotionally catering emoters, right? Our brains are wired a certain type of way, our, her, her, our hormonal systems are wired a certain type of way. It's not just that women are emotional, right? We have a hormonal system that creates or that cultivates that emotionalism, if that's the right word, right? So God wanted us to be this way. So for you know five days or seven days during a woman's physical cycle, she goes through an emotional kind of up and down, but God wanted it to be that way, right? Men also have a, a hormonal up and down that could be considered sort of you know similar to what women go through, but theirs is not once a month, it's every day, right? Mm. Chemical elements of the hormones are, are doing things and moving things around and it affects men and their emotional behavior in the way that they think, right? So, um, yes, there are roles. Um, now, I'm an intellectual, right? I'm a scientist, right? I love history. These are things in today's reality that we look at as masculine traits, masculine characteristics. So when I am, you know, over the past 10 years, as I've been kind of finding my way, you know, in and out of these different, you know, conversations and interviews and in and, and consciousness, I have found a very prevalent, um, you know, mindset that women need to stay in their lane when it comes to intellectualism or stay in your lane when it comes to science. There's no gender role for science. Mm. There's no gender role for mathematics. There's mm. no role for history, right? But we believe that. So we don't inspire women to become scholars and intellectuals and scientists. You see what I'm saying? And then just, I'll, I'll this is my last thing I'll say about this. <clears throat> Your soul doesn't have a gender. So everybody watching this right now, right? We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Right. Your soul doesn't have a gender. My soul's not a man. My soul will be imprinted and, and expanding through the experience of the woman that I am in Zaza Ali. But once I go back, you know, into the ethers, if you will, um, my soul won't be a woman. It'll just be my spirit and, and my soul, the fullness of and it. It will transcend into another body, if you will. Yes, if, if, if and when I decide to come back. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Dope, dope. Definitely, um, that was some um, metaphysical <laughs> type of uh, answer right there. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay, so you're saying that um, you do believe in uh, gender roles. So um, why do you think, you know, women are so against and, you know, cooking for their husband, cooking for their boyfriend? Um, and, you know, men, you know, sometimes they would say, oh, you know, I want my woman to pay half the bills. So I want my woman to pay 75, you know, if she got the money, why not? Why is there such a, um, a glitch or like, you know, a clash in gender roles identities? Yeah. Well, you know, um, that's, that's a multi-layer question. Um, when I wrote my Keys to Womanhood workbook, there's a section in there where I show 
uh, statistics graphs of the entire world. Um, and it's a color graph and it shows the areas of the world where women are safe, the areas of the world where women are not safe, the areas where high concentrations of rape, high concentrations of abuse, right? And so when I was working through this part of the workbook, it absolutely blew my mind that there is not one place in this, on this planet that women are considered safe. Wow. Safe meaning, you know, nobody's grabbing their purse when they're walking down a dark street or, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it was mind blowing to me, right? Because have I ever lived anywhere in, in America where women are actually considered safe? No. Now, have I ever been, you know, has anybody ever, a man ever like physically attacked me? I like, no, but I carry myself a certain type of way, right? right. But that excuse me from, you know, still being interested in understanding what other people are, or other women are having to go through. Again, because I'm a woman, I give birth to children, right? So um, when I found that out, it really blew my mind. So keeping that at the forefront, right? A lot of women now are rebelling against everything that men say a woman is supposed to be. Oh, you say I'm supposed to be a cook? No, nope, I'm done with that. You say I'm supposed to have children? No, nope, I'm done with that. You say I'm supposed to get married? No, nope, I'm done with that. Because they are just in complete rebellion of everything that this world has become and the marginalization um, and the abuse of women, right? So there's that. And, you know, is it right or wrong? You know, you can't qualify right or wrong for an individual, right? Because everybody mm -hmm. has free will. So and for their opinion as well. Absolutely. And their opinion. And they're 100% entitled to it. Um, you know, it's funny that, let's say, for instance, I, I say sexuality has been weaponized, right? Where, you know, whereas at once upon a time we were dealing with, you know, just mass rape and all of these things, and we still are. Um, so now instead of you, you know, turning me into a prostitute, not me, but turning a woman into a prostitute or, you know, objectifying her, right? Now women are just objectifying themselves, right? So weaponizing your means of trying to abuse me or trying to misuse me. You know, I'm a one up you, I'm gonna get to it before you do, right? Is that healthy? No. Is that smart? Absolutely not, you know, but it's again, it, the same thing has happened with our culture, rebelliousness and kind of rejecting this notion of racism and white supremacy has had detrimental, you know, uh, 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 effects in certain regard, right? We're not going to be a victim of, of the white man anymore, but how many men are, you know, um, projecting their anger and their hatred for the white man on their women, right? I've experienced that plenty of times. So um, I also think that because we live in a fast paced world, right? Everything is right now. You know, I mean, I can't tell you the, the benefit of just slowly cooking a meal and right putting love into it, right? God only eat one meal a day now. So I notice now that like my, my eating, my dinner time is like really special for me. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? In the morning, I've already thought about what I want to eat. If I need everything, <laughs> I'm going to the right. store, fresh ingredients, you know, um, the spices, the tastes, you know, I didn't eat in the morning. I'm not going to eat again after, I'm not eating for lunch. So it's a kind of special, you know, uh, uh, you know, connection that I have with the process of cooking and eating. And then also for my son, you know, uh, just cooking a healthy meal opposed to stopping and picking up something. And then, well, you know, when I started, you know, researching genetically modified food and understanding that there's fake lemons and fake oranges, you know, mm -hmm. okay, now, you know, I can't, well, McDonald's was now, you know, I would, where would I take my son? Um, like Boston market back okay. Right, something like that, you know, kind of fast home. But once I started learning those type of things, it was like, nah, I think we'll go home and eat. Exactly. Right? There's danger lurking, so to speak. Um, so I also think that, you know, we're so fast paced. We don't really, again, making the point I was making about cooking, you know, if I take an hour or an hour and a half to actually cook my meal, that's an hour to an hour and a half that I am 100% present focused on one thing that I know is going to be good for my body. My mind's yeah. not 
place. I'm not checking Instagram every five minutes. I'm not thinking about, you know, work or like I'm, I'm, I'm present. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so that, that kind of real thing. life. Yeah. That fast pace. I want it now. I need to hurry up and get out of here. I'm on the run. You know, I'm on the move that whole thing. Um, I think that has a lot of us, you know, kind of messed up. And then, you know, it's not doing men justice to have, these very primitive minded males online screaming, you need to get in the kitchen and cook my food. It's just not moving the conversation forward, right. right? Because it's not done from a place of love or this is what our children need or you know, this is what's in your best interest. It's done from the place of I am a man, you're gonna do what I tell you to do. You know, that type of simple minded, you know, kind of mentality that is is kind of keeping this war between men and women going, right? If I live alone and I'm cooking for myself, that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not I have a man. If I have company, if I cook for them, I'm cooking for me because I want to live well. So it, I think that if men were a little bit more less about, you know, do what I say because I tell you to do it and more looking at women and nurturing them, going back to that feminine energy, nurturing women with a little bit more support and encouragement, not because right. I this is what you're supposed to do but because this is actually the best thing for you and for all of us right i think that that would probably you know make those type of conversations a little bit um you know easier the half the bills thing i don't know anything about that i've never had a man <laughs> ask me to split bills you know i i live with my son's father we were engaged we didn't have those type of conversations um but i also think the amount of money that our the amount of energy that our culture puts on money we yeah because we emphasize it and it's like the end all be all that naturally it's become a, it's going to come a point of you know of of discontent so to speak because look at how much attention we pay to we pay to that right so i think that the concept of being equally yoked right woman bringing something to the table man bringing right. something to the table if you are a man that's going for your phd in school and you know your wife is actually making good money right and you want to take some time off so you can secure your phd so you can go to the next you know stage of your career and she's holding the, the family down financially there's nothing for anybody to be bragging about there's nothing for anybody to be feeling less than about because both parties are equally yoked he's pursuing higher education so that he can build a stronger family and she's holding the family down financially so it's not always a black and white or just a every you know case it's a case by case scenario right but as long as both parties are kind of coming to the to the table with you know respecting one another um i think that's the main the main thing the main priority Yes, indeed. Um, and I mean, uh, just like you said, yes, it is a case by case uh, scenario or situation. And it goes to um, the science of communication, right? Uh, they can communicate that, uh, okay, I'm going for my PhD, you can handle the financial load for, yes. you know, the next two, three years. Yes. So I think it's also important for us to communicate more to our significant others, to our family members, to who, whomever, you know, we're in contact with. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I find that um, far too often that we uh, lack communication and then we assume, right? And then so assumption brings uh, miscommunication and miscommunication brings um, turmoil to whatever situation of uh, whatever relationship that you may have with the other person. It may be friendship, it may be intimate relationship, um, co-workership or whatever. Yeah. So I just feel like also that uh, level of communication um, needs to be, you know, um, it, it needs to be potent and it, it needs to be strong and, you know, really say what you have on your mind and vice versa. And, and I think that a lot of, you know, women really need to, uh, you know, I don't know any women that, that want to do it all on their own, but there's a lot of women that are like, yes, I can do it all on my own. Yeah. You're projecting that into the world and you're going to continue to run into relationships and have experiences that are going to force you to do it all on your own, right? Mm -hmm. Most women that are, you know, on that real strong, I'm independent, I don't need a man. Well, men need to be needed. So what are we going to do? You know what I mean? It's not just us against them. This is a collective. Whether you're, you know, a woman that's into women or a man that's into men, like, and that's a different conversation, but <laughs> human beings 
all together like what are we going to do to bridge this gap so to speak. so you know you can take out the trash you can fix the tires go put oil in the car sure you can put gas like all of those things that we spend so much time talking about no woman really wants to do all of that you know what i mean like no no woman wants to be shoveling you know snow in her garage right, right. all of these kind of like tangible physical things that you know we expect men to do can i do all of those things yes i can i do you want to i've actually fixed an air conditioner on my own right can i do it yes am i walking out with a s on my chest because i fixed an air conditioner on my own no i would much rather you yeah go ahead and handle it i'll be back mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i mean but we also have to remember that a lot of our women are raising children in war zones right i mean if, 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 if we talk about america africa is a whole another conversation right mm. caveats of what are happening on the continent so you know we got to be careful at the same time when, when, when women are raising children alone or with mates in house in, in war zones, right? It's going to take a certain level of masculine energy in order to maintain your sanity in those type of environments, right? So this whole thing about pipe down, stop being so strong when we haven't cultivated environments and conditions that can help women not have to be so strong. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of little caveats, you know, when it comes to these conversations. Right, right. And I mean, um, I know many women, and I'm pretty sure there's, you know, any however amount of percentage of women that is like, oh, I can do it all by myself. Um, and because you have to, and because you have to, you will, yes. But yeah. uh, just like you alluded to, if you don't have to, then of course you will, you know, have the man surely to take care of those other responsibilities. Yeah. Um, but uh, since there, either single fathers, if you have a conversation with a single father, that is not a one parent job. You know what I mean? So, so when it comes to the raising and rearing of children, none of us should be out here saying I could do it. I can do it by myself. Yeah. Even can do it by yourself it is a two-person job you exactly know? exactly right and i mean I, I totally agree but there are females it's like listen i could do it on by myself even when even when the father wants to be in the child's life yeah. some way shape or form the mother tries to divert the father away from the child and say oh i can do it all by myself my my mother raised me all by myself so i can do it right yeah. And so, uh, again, but I think that's the low-frequency, um, toxic uh, femininity that uh, we are about to go into, right? Because that mindset, um, again, as you alluded to, uh, as you alluded to earlier, uh, the woman is the first teacher of that child. So that message she gives to the child, that child gives to the world. And if you can see, this world is still in, in, in the uh, toxic, um, low-frequency uh, mindset and energies that is circling in right now and, and and so yes it is the mother's fault you know partially and partially it is the father's fault the the fathers that wants to be there the mothers is, is not letting him be a father and the fathers that don't want to be there we should shed light on that as well um but let's bring it back to the toxic uh femininity um, what is it and how can we overcome it? Well, I would say toxic femininity is a, a you know, expressed um, element of the lower self in women. I think toxic femininity not only applies to women, but it also applies to men. I think that uh, Lil Nas X on the cover of a magazine pretending to be pregnant is a representation. Yes of toxic femininity how so zaza because every man has a feminine and a masculine element of himself yin and yang just like every woman has a masculine and feminine element of herself yin and yang right so for a man to be that far out of his understanding and awareness of himself right the notion that you somehow you know think that you can be a woman or can, you know, do the things that women do us or even just playing the game, so to speak, 
that's a variation of toxic femininity to me, right? Now, let me answer your question directly. So toxic femininity is what we just talked about, that whole idea of I don't need a man or I can do it all on my own. Mm -hmm. I can do it all, all, all on my own is not just about not doing it with a man. It's also about I don't need family supports. I don't need any friends. I don't need mm -hmm. any help me i don't need any sisters i don't need a sister circle right that's also i can do it on my own that's toxic femininity because we know you can do it but your but your but your demeanor and your uh uh disposition about doing it is not healthy right you know what i mean it's it's a it's a lack-based consciousness right so um it's also the weaponizing of the sexuality right? The Cardi B's and the Megan Thee Stallions of the world. And it's funny because I saw a post where Cardi B was, what happened? She was upset over some, she was upset about comments that someone put on her daughter's some page. I don't know. I just perused through it. Um, and so I was thinking to myself, well, you know, all of the pee popping that you've done and all of the blatant disrespect that you've done of yourself, did you ever consider any of our daughters? And our sons, right? right? So weaponizing sexuality. Anytime you weaponize anything that God gave you, there's going to be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the weaponizing of sexuality, uh, this strong, you know, pro-feminism um, minus activism for men is very toxic to me, right? When I say that, I mean, I understand the purpose of feminism. I'm not anti-feminist. Um, you know, the feminism and womanism dichotomy is kind of two things under the same umbrella. But um, if you're purely pro women and you and you don't have anything for men, you don't have any love, you don't have any message, you don't have any concern, you don't have any awareness. That's toxic femininity to me. Why? Because women give birth to both. Right. So not only do we give birth to both through our wombs physically, but the woman also gives birth to both through her birth to both through her mind. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, when a woman speaks, if she's speaking from her divine feminine self, she will have a completely different impact. Right. On on, you know, the minds of the masses, so to speak. If she's speaking from her divine feminine self, how many women do we actually have out here to understand how that works? Not too many. Right. So um, there's that element. And I just think that, you know, we've kind of weaponized womanhood, you know, through the rape culture conversations and the Me Too movement. And now, granted, I just told you there's nowhere on the planet that women are really safe. Right. So we right. have to keep that. We, that has to be a continuous part of the conversation. But I also think that you know, um, there's just a lot of very anti-man sentiment, which for me, having a son, I can never be anti-man because if I'm anti-man, then I'm creating a poisonous man. Mm. Right? So I think that, you know, there's a lot of very unbalanced, unscrupulous language being applied to men and to manhood, so to speak. Have a lot of men earned it? Absolutely. But does it apply to all men? Absolutely not, right? So this generalizing that everything is men's fault, men do everything wrong, and men are the problem. No, you, we give birth to both sexes. Exactly. So there's no exactly. way as a woman that I could ever just be like, men are the problem. No, where's his mother? Let me talk to right. her. Let me see what, 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 what his lineage and his stock, and the, not only his mother, but the win, women that are in his environment, right? So I think that those are, you know, um, some of some 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 reflections of toxic femininity right right uh so now um I, i've heard you speak on the quote-unquote whole culture um what is that and is that similar to the toxic femininity yes it is the weaponizing of sexuality um it is the stripper culture now being embraced and promoted and you know not only by strippers or by past strippers or by, you know, future strippers of the world. Um, but, you know, if Cardi B can sit down and, and do an interview with, um, what was his name? Uh, he was running for... Um, Joe Biden? Not Joe Biden, the other one. Uh, Donald his, Trump? Nope, the other one. His name's on the tip of my tongue. Um, 
you guys know who I'm talking about. She sat down and did an interview with uh, this Bernie Sanders. Oh. She did an interview. With, she did an interview with Bernie or or Joe. They're all the same to me. But you know, somehow this notion now that you know we have these these avatars that represent stripper and whole culture, which is what they are. And when I say avatar, I mean you know a either a visual or a spiritual or a mental um, you know kind of character uh, uh, or caricature, right? That is put out in front of the world and made as a you know a focus point so to speak so women now are cheering you know megan the stallion and i the the chloe haley i think is her name the the part of the sister group i was looking at this this um one of her videos and it made me think about something uh remember the the challenge when all of the women were like basic robes you know hair bonnet and then they they dropped down and did the whole little busted move, and then they came back up and did a real like sexy you know type of thing. It was a TikTok thing. Mm -hmm. Girl looks like a little girl to me when she's not all made up and you know very risque and you know what I mean, dancing and shaking and all that stuff. She's a beautiful and they have beautiful voices, but when she's not all dolled up, she looks like a regular girl to me. You know what I mean? Like I I would right. not meet her and and equate some of the visuals that I've seen of her. So I'm saying that to say that now we've kind of positioned our daughters and our women in a way where they feel like they have to sell sex or be very provocative or promiscuous behavior mm -hmm. in order for, for people to pay attention to them. Right. I mean, you know, we got Beyonce's worth what almost a billion dollars now and she's still kind of like on this real strong sexual element you got two daughters at this point like at what point do you start to pivot from okay sex sales which it does I understand yeah. it. but at what point do you start to pivot out of you know that mindset and into a matriarchal mindset right yeah. When we talk about matrilineal and matriarchal mindset, these are not women that were like just in the crowd turning up, right? This is a a a a a cultural understanding that women play a very sacred and important role in the dichotomy of our world, right? Tribes, civilizations, cultures, whatever, right? So when you understand that. As a queen, I understand that how I carry myself is going to affect the girls and the women that come among me, the girls and the women that see me, right? Right. And that I, if I sit here and have a conversation with you and I am very sexually uh, giving off very strong sexual energy, that is going to completely change the dichotomy of this conversation. Do oh. I have the right to do that? Of course. Can I sit here with you and just and, and just choose the way I want to represent myself and nobody can say anything to me? Of course, but I'm a queen, right? So because I'm a queen, I understand that my conversation with you, my body language when I talk to you, the way that I conduct myself is going to affect the men that are going to watch this and the women that are going to watch this as well, right? So I carry myself as a queen because I have a responsibility. In whole culture, there's no such thing. In whole culture... Demon time is a is a very uh, popular. It's not as popular now, but during the you know the, the 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 quarantine element, the lockdown, we actually had demon time become a part of our culture. Where now, oh, you can't go to the stripper club. Just go to Instagram Live live during a certain period of time, right? Now, was that great for the strippers who were still trying to make their money? Sure. The ten and the fifteen year old boys that we're up watching, not so much, right? right? So queens understand that, hoes don't. You see what I'm saying? So the whole culture is, I can wear whatever I wanna wear and carry myself with however I wanna carry myself and do whatever I wanna do. Even if I'm shaking my behind in the camera and gyrating and on the ground, you know, doing porno moves, right? you understand the science of the way that a man is wired and the way that boys are wired, they're going to get turned on. Right? So what does he do when he gets turned on and then he turns off Instagram? Does he become a, a pedophile? Does he become mm. this? Is he out in the community and in the culture disrespecting women? Cause he got a heart on now and doesn't know how to express it. Right? 
This is whole culture. Yeah. We want to stimulate you no matter what. We want the attention, the sexual gratification, the sexual stimulation, regardless of how it affects everybody else. Because we after the bag, right? What do the, the whole culture, what do prostitutes do? They have sex for money, right? So now it is has pivoted from just being about sex and it's selling sex, but you're still selling sex. Right. Right? So I don't know, you know, women are going to have to start putting our big boy pants up and, you know what I mean, like having real conversations without our feelings getting in the way, if you want to talk to me, that is, um, about how we're carrying ourselves in the broader context of how it's affecting our sons and our daughters and our men. Wow, indeed, indeed. Uh, all right, family, so we have reached the uh, halfway point uh, in our show. Uh, so we will do a quick uh, commercial break. All right. Uh, so for the family who are now tuning in, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, glad to see all of you. All right. Uh, you are now listening to DTR 360 Books Podcast. You can find us on any uh, pa podcast platform. All right. We have the very special guest in here uh, tonight, uh, Queen Sister Zaza Ali. Uh, she has spoken on uh, numerous things um, and upcoming shortly and momentarily uh, she will be speaking on her books uh, that she currently have out uh, six uh, she has authored uh, six books and we will be speaking about those momentarily again again thank you all for tuning in and uh, thank you all for your patience as well you are now listening to DTR 360 books podcast you can find us on youtube you can find us on youtube at dtr 360 books you can like our facebook business page dtr 360 books we are also on twitter and tiktok all right so let's get back into it brother can i say something real quick because yes. someone said something in the chat and i want to go back and make sure i'm not i didn't reread it Miss. Mm. um so there's a difference as far as your purpose right and I'm going to take that as or interpret that as maybe I carry myself a little bit different because I have a purpose, right? I have a broader purpose in terms of the work. As, as everyone should. <laughs> as everyone should. Yes. Here's the thing. And I, and I don't want to, you know, misconstrue what it is that you're saying, but I want to make this point. I need for girls and women to really understand <clears throat> That the way you carry yourself and the energy that you move out into the world with is what's actually creating your reality, right? So if you're moving in the world purely on a sexual frequency or a promiscuous frequency or, you know, the way that you represent yourself, even if in quote unquote real life, you know, I'm not, I'm not like that in real life. I just do that for social media, right? But the, the frequency that you're emanating with the intention is having ripple effects and it goes out into the ethers and then it comes back and it brings things to you, right? So as a woman, I know the difference in how I carry myself if I, based on what I'm wearing, the energy that I receive, right? I, you know, I'm not no square. I grew up in Oakland, California, right? So I am very well aware of negative male attention and positive male attention, right? Now I'm not making any concessions for negative male attention. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be put in its place, right? But as a woman, when you move out into the world, when you understand the difference between those two things, I understood at a very young age, I didn't want that negative attention. I'm doing everything that I can to stay away from that type of attention, right? So I carry myself intentionally because I don't want that type of attention, right? We don't live in a world with, you know, high-minded you know, sexually disciplined men and women where we can all just kind of, you know what I mean? Like we live in a world where most people are not sexually disciplined. They have no respect for the sacred sexual sciences, right? They're not well informed when it comes to how their body works, right? If you're a man and you, you know, you having sex with, you know, five different women every other week, well, you're going to have some problems real soon, right? So I think that, you know, it's not just that I, Zaza Ali, like have to carry myself a certain type of way because of what I do. Any woman that wants respect is going to carry herself in a certain type of way. Respect has to be earned. I naturally respect you as a human being, right? My brother, 
we having a conversation now. I didn't know much about you before we had this conversation. I can look at DTR 360 and get a certain level of respect, but I can't really respect you until me and you sit down and have a meeting of the minds, right? Okay, so respect right. has to be earned. And I think that women and girls need to really understand that, how you carry yourself. You can't objectify yourself and they get mad when you treat get treated like an object, right? That doesn't, that doesn't excuse the objective, the objectifier, if that's the word, right? That doesn't excuse that. But as a woman, I'm very keen on my responsibility, how I carry myself and the things that I attract to me. So I think that we, you know, this notion now that being modest or being, you know, mindful about how you carry yourself as a woman, as a woman is like an oxymoron. No, going back to history, you don't, you don't see images of, you know, of, of orgies and, you know, in, in, in Greece, yeah, Rome, yeah, right? But in yeah. Africa and in the indigenous cultures of the world, you see women carrying themselves a certain type of way and they love, they love tens of thousands of, you know, uh, uh, books and, you know, the, the tombs and all of the inscriptions and all of the, you know, all of our historical context. Never was there a time when, when women were just kind of like, yeah, we're going to let it all hang out and see what happens. Not because they weren't free, but because they understood their power. That's what I'm trying to get under, of women to understand. Indeed. And un understanding your power is very key. Yeah. Understanding your power is, is paramount to your identity and to who you are as a person. Um, so, man... Uh, again, as you alluded to, uh, sister, um, many of us don't even understand how our body works, don't understand the anatomy of self, the anatomy of woman, the anatomy of man. Yeah. And we just out here uh, living <laughs> freely mm -hmm. or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about your first book. You wrote titled Black Matters. Subtitled The Scientific Intervention in Our Affairs, which came out in about uh, 2015. You spoke on eugenics, vaccinations, crack cocaine, chemtrails, organ traffic, uh, trafficking, and much more. Uh, so uh, first, I, I want to ask, why did you label it Black Matters? And then second, a two-part question. Um, I see that you were ahead of your time because these topics and subject matters that are discussed in this book is still playing out in today's time, yeah. uh, 20, uh, 2022, yeah. so about seven years later. Um, so did, did you have like a foresight of these subject matters being still played out in today's time or were you just discussing it hoping that we will come to a solution on these subject matters yeah no i i totally had vision and foresight and you know just going back to this previous conversation when we you know women are 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 supposed to be intuitive and have discernment right so that whole same example that I just gave about being intuitive and having discernment about how you carry yourself. So now fast forward to as I was, you know, what, 13 years ago in Oakland, just kind of paying attention to what was happening in the sky. Right. And seeing these lines crisscross out of nowhere and just, you know, I, but I had to see it. My, my, my mind had to have the capacity to see it. Most people don't. Even today, most people don't even have, have no idea that there's this global worldwide agenda that is spraying toxins above their heads all over the world, right? And that was fascinating to me. And it got to a point once I kind of had my footing, at least I understood it, I would stand on the corner in Oakland off of on Lake Park Avenue and I would just stop people. And I would just be like, do you see that? Does that look strange to you? And nobody, they were all like, it's, you know, that's normal. We have an international airport, right? So that's what, you know, the, that's when a light went off for me as far as chemtrails, as far as, um, you know, um, 
crack cocaine, which is what I talked about. That goes back to me growing up in Oakland and seeing this, you know, beautiful burgeoning black city with all of this culture and this, you know, the wonderful experience that I had as a child. So now it's a war zone. You know, now I got people outside my house nodding and, you know, I'm standing up nodding. I don't know if you've ever wow. seen a, a dope fiends, a dope, that's, I don't know, is that politically correct? I don't know, I don't care. Um, if, but if you've ever seen somebody that's off of heroin, they can literally stand up and nod for hours. Mm. Right? So imagine as a child, you're seeing, you know, men and women on the corner standing around like just straight zombies, right? So it was, and then when several people in my family got hooked on crack cocaine, then I was like, okay, wait a minute. Like now we're scared of him coming over and we're hiding stuff when certain family members come over. And, you know, my brother-in-law was like, you know, wigging out and doing all kind of crazy stuff. So it was those things that initially that crack cocaine element, my, a light went off. And then, you know, when the when I started noticing chemtrails, a light went off. And then when I had my son and it was time for, you know, to go to the doctor and get the checkups and, you know, they're talking about these these shot schedules. OK, wait a minute. Right. What is it about? Right. So it was the trajectory of my life experiences that really made me be interested and intrigued in these things. And I titled it Black Matters because when I started researching, you know, these shots, um, particularly in Africa, I was learning about how, you know, the the Center for Dangerous Concussions, we'll call it that, the Center for Dangerous Concussion, Concussions, right? No, the CDC. Um, mm -hmm. They were all over Africa. They have stations all over Africa. And it was like, okay, you know, so I, then the conversations about Ebola kept coming up, right? Everything always starts in, in Africa. You know, the, the whole thing with the ape and the, um, and the Ebola uh, and everything started, right? You know, they say AIDS got started in Africa because yeah. of, you know, it was transferred through apes, right? There's more to it than that, but like, it always starts in Africa. And I was always like, why, you know, why are they always trying to pin this on us, right? Uh -huh. Especially because we never had any historical mass viruses. There was no like plagues, you know what I mean? From what I could tell. So um, black matters to me. I know there's a lot of argument, you know, people say, oh, don't call yourself black. That's the color of a crayon. Well, for me, the concept of black and Kim, it actually means the land of the black. So there's that, but um, the land of the blacks, but what, what was, made me endear myself to the 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 you know the element of black was i was thinking like you know the um the blackness of space the womb of space you know triple darkness of the womb of space right yes there's nothing but blackness in a woman's womb right that's a fact you know what i'm right. saying like can we contextualize that yeah but it's a fact it's darkness right. So that darkness, the triple darkness of the womb of space, so to speak, what I'm talking about when I talk about black. And then obviously, you know, when you talk about melanin and black being the absorber of all radiation, right? See, I, I have a book. Um, actually, it's right here because I'm, I'm using this. Um, in this book, it's called Blackness. The Meaning of Blackness is by a brother named Amnur. I don't even think this book is available for, for resale anymore. But in it, he talks about black noise right black holes black bodies right these are scientific and and um and philosophical terms that are in textbooks medical textbooks physics te textbooks scientific you know chemistry right so european and white scientists and doctors don't have an issue with the term black they're very clear what it means and it is a very powerful you know, language that they use in terms of black bodies, you know, black holes, etc. We're the only ones that want to, you know, and I understand the, the whole argument about it. But um, when I use the term black matters, I'm talking about the womb, the triple darkness of space, right? And how that has brought forth everything that we know. That's the spiritual aspect. The physical aspect is we are the dominant people on this planet, whether you came from Africa or the native the native people of America, the original indigenous people, African people are the original people of this planet. Those are black people. Mm 
right. not black like like you know a black pen or like black like my phone screen but black like the triple womb of space mm. that's what i was talking about and there's blue black people in senegal and there's blue black people in you know the congo right there's blue black arabs right, right. So that's what i was referring to I, I wasn't trying to like you know call myself a color crayon like i right. that, that's <laughs> elementary when people say that type of stuff to me it's like yeah i was having those conversations you know when i was 18 you know what i'm saying like fresh yeah. out of high school. that's not new to me right um so yeah that's that's where black matters came from and then you know just that my curiosity of science and how things got to where they were for our people in particular around the world is what what inspired me to write that first book awesome awesome and uh, i love uh you have your own publishing company correct Yes, yes, I yes. yes. I, I love that. Um, ever since 2014, 2015, the first book came out, um, you have your self-publishing company as well. Totally, totally uh, independent. Um, and that's what made me respect you more because a lot of these, uh, you know, scholars, and they are scholars, um, but, you know, they have their book on Amazon. They, uh, you know, are using other publishing, you know, white publishing companies and so although you know about uh the society in which we live in yet you are still contributing to our oppression through amazon through yeah. these white institutions um and so if we want to solely be independent and have a leg up of some sort then we must move away from the services and institutions if you will that fund our oppression yeah. I mean, that seems uh, simplistic, but, <laughs> uh, you know, scholars and people who you think would have enough sense, they don't do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, throw that out there. And I agree. Uh, and I, you're actually, I think you might be the first person that ever asked, actually asked me about my publishing company, which is very interesting because I've done a lot of interviews. But it was very important for me. Um, and my two books are on Amazon. So let's just. Yes. That's a, you know, that's the strategy element, right? Because you run a business, you know. Um, but all of my, my books are available to be purchased directly through my website. And I... Which is? Uh, ZazaAli.com. But I, once I decided to become self-published, uh, the original, the first book that I wrote, I paid someone to, you know, to do the all of the administrative things that it takes to publish a book, right? I was still self-published, but I hired out for someone else to do all of the logistics to get the book in print. And after that, and especially it cost me $1,500 just to do that. I said, I'll never pay anybody else to, 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 you know what I mean? To do this part. So I just learned everything. I know how to publish a book from beginning all the way to the end. Right. That's a very valuable kind of skill set. I'm going to, you know, put that information out and help people learn how to do that for themselves. But yeah, that was very important for me my i own all of the rights to all of my my books and my content and that will be turned over to my son one day so i'm building a legacy you know for him right publishing company right right indeed indeed and i, I would love to work with you on you know the self-publishing workshop or course if you will whichever yes. one you um come up with right. uh, because i do have a platform and i do have a lot of authors who follow me yeah. as well um and they asked me you know if i have a publishing course i haven't gotten into that uh to the oh, aspect of I got, I got books you. yet yeah i got you and i got them too i as i've definitely right. put together a full concise from beginning to end this is what you do in order to make it happen so yes we can definitely you know connect on that right right and for me it's, it's just like the time because I, i'm a teacher myself if you don't know I'm a teacher myself, and so after this interview, I have to go in and um, report cards is about to, you know, come up. So <laughs> I got to put in some you, grades and comments and everything. What do you teach? Um, so l let's uh, talk about your um, other four books. Um, so you have The Science of Self, um, From Lack to Abundance. You have Keys to Womanhood. I love that. And Change Your Mind. Yes. Uh, oh, and you have the science of sex, correct? Yes. yes. Right. Yes. Um, so if you could, let's let's um, speak on um, womanhood, right? Uh, from um, what we've, you know, alluded to many of key attributes to womanhood and so forth. 
Uh, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why did you write a book uh, specifically for women, Keys to Womanhood? Well, you know, I didn't grow up with my mother. Um, my father and my father's side of my family raised me. Um, so I spent a lot of my younger years and my formative years really trying to figure out a lot of things that I should have had a woman in my life to help me to learn, you know? Um, and I did have women in my life, but, you know, I wasn't their priority, um, so to speak. So there were a lot of, you know, lessons and challenges along the way as a, as a young woman and as a woman that I've learned and that I've experienced that I know for a fact that if I had had a continuous, you know, feminine perspective and guidance to help me, that I wouldn't have made a lot of those, those mistakes, you know? So I wanted to um, give girls and women my perspective, all the things that I wish another woman had told me, um, even up to the point of, you know, the woman's cycle and what's happening in her body during that time of month, right? Not just, you know, knowing to go to the store and what to buy, but to understand what's actually happening in your body. Day one, you know, day one through five, this is what's going on. Day, you know, six through 10, this is what's going on. Day 10 through 30, this is what's actually happening in your body. And imagine, you know, 12 year old and 13 year old girls, once they start their cycle to actually have a reference, not just their mothers or their family, but a, 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 a reference and a resource to help them to get through that, let alone the girls who are raising themselves. I was right. uh, raised myself, right? I had my family, but once I turned 14, you know, I was working and had a roommate, right? So there's a lot of girls even that have families that are raising themselves. So I wanted to give them some jewels and some tools, the girls with parents, with family and without in order to make the process a little bit easier, you know? I didn't really start learning about like the chakras, let's say for instance, until my thirties. Imagine right. if I'd been, you know, 50 yeah. years old and somebody had been showing, telling me, right. you know, you have a throat chakra. So yes. this is connected to how you speak and, you know- Communicate. What, communicate, right. And here's what a balanced, healthy chakra looks like. And here's what an imbalanced and unhealthy chakra looks like, right? So, you know, let's say for instance, the conversation about angry women, right? The women who are bitter, all the women that are online, like just espousing all of this negativity and this insanity, right? Well, they're operating from the lower throat chakra, the lower aspect that's an unbalanced, unhealthy throat chakra. I don't need to know you to know that, right? So mm -hmm. we armed 5 million, 10 million girls with this science and this level of understanding of their body and how to relate to men. I don't just talk about, you know, love and relationships and your intimate partner. I also talk about respecting and honoring the divine masculine not the not the craziness not the not the, the the insanity but the divine masculine what does that even mean cultivating relationships with your uncles with your cousins with your grandfathers right with all the men that are in your family and that are in your cipher that don't have anything to do with the person that you're in a relationship with right that's a that's a science of womanhood that we're not taught the transmutation I say a lot of women, you know, are in relationships or don't know how to be alone because they're scared to be alone, right? So if we started consciously transmuting the energy, meaning you have men in your life that you can talk to, they may not be sexual partners, but they got good brains. You yeah. have your life that are, you know, doing well in their own personal business or their own lives, right? They've got things that can bring value to your life. This is masculine wisdom masculine energy you don't always have to be involved with a man in order to get value from men in our relationships the way this world is wired now everything's about relationships who you're in relationship with you know and i get it i understand the importance of that but there is another dichotomy and a level of relationship between man and woman that doesn't have that doesn't have to be your sexual partner or your boyfriend or your husband right so I wanted to really start us as women and girls to start thinking just beyond the man that we choose, right? We have, a re we have a responsibility in rearing up and raising up the consciousness of boys and men. And I want us to be actively participating in that. Yes, yes, men. Indeed, indeed. 
let's switch gears a bit um and we're uh winding down my computer light is almost out okay. um so i know you're into yoga and meditation how has yoga and meditation been a benefit to you i, I i've done my research <laughs> yes have. thank you very much and i'm i really appreciate the you know the questions you you get you have good questions um man yoga i cannot stress it enough you know it <clears throat> i originally got into yoga because i had issues with my ankles um i wore high heels consistently during my 20s i was in the corporate world and it changed my walking pattern which messed up my ankles i, I had an injury to my right knee behind that and it also caused me occasional um hip pain at that time so that's why i originally got into yoga because i was trying to heal those issues with uh with my ankles and then later you know corporal tunnel became an issue for me a few years after that so i went back to yoga healed myself from corporal tunnel um using yoga as well as bentonite clay um so that's why i initially got into it and um once i started i just really loved it you know and it's like being 100 percent present focused mindful um and aware of what's happening in your body it takes place in yoga in a way that i haven't experienced that in another in another you know practice so to speak so i think yoga is that mind and heart and body cohesive element when you practice enough it will kind of bring you into alignment and then meditation um this noise is just this world is too loud right you there's too much noise there's too much chaos you know so for me it became very important especially once i got on social media and started you know engaging with tens of thousands of people and now i you know have all these people be circulating in my world and you know impacting me in different ways um it became really important for me to turn the world off so to speak and so that i could just really get quiet and one of the things that i recommend especially for now you know you have to have time where you spend time alone and you have to have time where there there's nothing else with you but your mind your own thoughts being able to listen to yourself and hear how you think and hear if you're naturally inclined to be negative or naturally inclined to be present right so for me that's what meditation is at first it started out as just listening to myself because i couldn't quiet my mind obviously so let me just observe what's happening on in here and mm -hmm. as i serving and I'm like what what <laughs> you know what I'm saying like who are you talking to like why would you talk to me like that you know so that observation process and then once you start observing now you have the ability to say okay I like this I don't like that we're keeping this we're not keeping that right all of that's meditation meditation is not just you know zoning out to to Buddhist chants and you know or being on a mountainside no yoga is being internally aware of what's happening inside of you and being able to make it work for you right so you can walk and meditate so when i'm at the beach and i'm listening to the beach waves and i'm taking in the frequency of that environment i'm still meditating when i'm doing yoga and i'm very intentionally focused and the breath work is in alignment with my physical body that's a meditation right so I think we, you know, our, our concept of meditation has to expand. Obviously, you go to different parts of the world, there's a different there's different ways of meditating. But for me, because I've been so kind of just looking at this world, you know, since probably like 10, I've been looking at this world like this ain't God's world. You know, like I, this ain't where I'm from. I know I'm not from here. At 10, I was right. like, I'm here visiting, but I know this is not where I'm originally from because right. the the suffering and the insanity, I feel like meditation provides you with a way of kind of bridging the gap between this world and that world of, you know, love and peace and prosperity, which is where we come from, which is where and what God is, you know? Right, right. Um, awesome. One last question. Uh, well, two. Um, seeing that this is an uh, educational platform, um, I have a passion for education myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I love your background, by the way. Tons and tons of books. I know those are some of those are hard to find, yeah. rare books. Yeah. Um, and that's what I love. Um, but what is education to you? Seeking knowledge. I've always been a knowledge seeker. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know, in education, you go to school, you get educated, right? So, but for me, seeking knowledge has just always, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, 
um what was i looking at last night i was i was i was watching a movie and something intrigued me that I, that I was watching in the movie and then I went online and looked at oh it was a, some animal or something so I go online and start researching this weird looking concubine thing um I just love how things are made I love how you know how how buildings are made how how doors like the things that we use I just love the creative process so to speak it goes from a thought my books went from a thought in my mind to actually eventually physically holding them in my hands to now I have reviews on my website from people telling me about the impact that they've had. Right. So just a thought yeah. in the started as a thought in the mind and now it's had ripple effects all over the world. Right. So seeking knowledge and being interested in learning is education for me. And I think because of, you know, where the world is heading right now, we're going to have to get out of the mindset of going to be educated and taking the conscientious, you know, focus of educating ourselves. So seeking knowledge. For me, it was history. That was the first thing for me. Then it was right. science, right? Then it was religion. Then it was metaphysics, right? But I had to have a, a hunger and a thirst for all of those subjects to even be interested. So if you love to do hair, then study cosmetology inside and out. Not just what they're teaching you at the school. You know, the I've done presentations where I've talked about the sacred geometry of braiding and how black and African women all over the world have recreated geometric patterns that are natural to, you know, uh, nature in the universe. And a black woman can just take her fingers and do like this. And next thing you know, she's created that pattern in your head. She didn't go to school. She didn't go take a college course in how to do African braiding. She just naturally has it in her DNA, right? So mm -hmm. she's an educated woman because she's expressing her God-given talents through her fingers and right. going step forward and learning about like sacred geometry and things like that and how it ties in the antennas of the hair in plagues of dysfunction i talk about the antennas of the hair and how you know the the, the proximity to the brain makes the hair one of the first you know uh um one of the first elements if you will where the sun is meeting the scalp and that whole process of the coil of the hair being the antenna and all of those things you know so that's metaphysics of hair so if you're studying mm. cosmetology, yeah, you can learn how to do a flat iron and a, and, a, and a press and a perm. Go for it. But also there's a deeper science and a deeper le a, a level to that, that if you're a knowledge seeker, you're naturally going to be interested in. And it's going to make you flyer as a hair designer. And it's going to make your social media pages flyer for doing that, talking about sacred geometry and African hair braiding, right? So right. just being a lover of knowledge and a lover of information, whatever it is that you're interested in and kind of going into the metaphysics of it. Yes, yes. And uh, I go by the um, acronym ASK, always seek knowledge, right? Yes. ASK, always seek knowledge. So yes. uh, definitely um, always seek knowledge, but don't forget to apply the knowledge as well, which is our, <laughs> which is our model. Applied knowledge is true power. That's our model. Um, so... Uh, yeah. So, beloved, uh, one last question. So, if, what advice and or suggestion would you give to your younger self? Oh, man. Um, slow down. You know, I, um, because of my, my upbringing, I was always on to the next thing. Even with like my books, you know, I've talked about this before. I write a book and then I'm on to the next book. I'm already, uh, I want to wow. finish a book. Even if it's not printed in hand, I'm already on to the next book. You know, this wow. time that I'm getting ready to write has been, I've been wanting to write this for 10 years. But like, you know, I don't think I give myself enough credit, um, you know, and just celebrating and honoring all of the things that I've done. And I've done a lot of things, you know, I, I have at, at this stage of the game, like, I don't think I've really like stepped back and just kind of assessed all of these different layers and levels of where I've been within myself. So I think slow down, smell the roses, you know what I mean? Appreciate the little things. Um, and just really like you, you're doing so much better than what you realize, you know, right being so hard on yourself stop judging yourself so much stop you know I, I had a lot of people projecting onto me my whole life so I've spent a lot of times trying to wiggle out of their 
projections, right? The whole light skin, curly hair thing. You know what I mean? Like, I went through a whole period where that was, like, a big thing for me. Like, no, I'm not just that. Like, don't you see all so of Much that, more, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, none of that matters. Like, like, like you are 100% good enough and valuable and, and powerful just as you are. You know, right where you are, right where you stand at 13, at 20, at 25, at 30. Like I was always, you know, ready, willing and able. You know what I mean? At, at all of those different stages, I was always, you know, a visionary. So I think that but I wasn't giving myself enough credit. I was just like, yeah, forget all of that. On to the next thing. So mm. slow down, smell the roses, um, spend more time in nature. And you got a, a very big you know, role to play um, in, in what's about to go down on this planet. So, you know, be grateful to, to God, to the creator, to the ancestors um, for choosing me and for arming me with what I needed in order to do what, what, what has to be done. Indeed, indeed, man. Um, I don't want this to end. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure we can go another hour but um we do have uh time constraints uh but thank you thank you so much beloved uh man thank you for your time for your energy for your wisdom um for your knowledge um understanding overstanding and understanding on various topics that we uh spoke about i didn't even get to ask you on a question on metaphysics and scientific warfare and things of that nature so we definitely have to do a part two uh, if your schedule permits. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, soon, inshallah, our um, my main page will be, you know, active to go live on. Um, but hey, you know, we got it done by God's grace. Yeah. And um, again, family, if you are on, definitely uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel for the full version of this podcast interview. Um, and you can follow us and subscribe to our podcast outlets as well. Um, and support, uh, support the Queen, support the Empress, uh, www.zazaali.com. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. beloved, uh, any last words? Uh, shout out to all my people in the chat room. I've seen your, your comments uh, come up here and there. But, um, man, I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to be alive. I'm happy to have the mind that I have to be aware and awoke. Like I need for everybody that's listening to me to understand if you have not been fooled by this propaganda, if you have not been, you know, mentally and spiritually and emotionally broken by all of this psychological insanity, not only from the government, but from your family, from all of the people in your world. If you lost a job or you left a job or you, you know, are, are standing on your square right now by whatever means necessary, please understand how valuable that is. That is the most valuable commodity that we can have in this hour to have, you know, control over our mental faculties and how we move on this planet. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful time to be alive. And I'm just really glad. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad the ancestors chose me. Um, and I, when I do, I told you I'm doing the history textbook. That's for all the homeschoolers out there. Take your children out of these schools. I am creating content that's going to help you with that process. Um, but you, we can't be afraid anymore. This is moving forward. We have to be sovereign minded. So sovereign as far as business, sovereign as far as, you know, education and how we teach ourselves and learn, sovereign about the people that we, we choose to surround ourselves with and just like spiritually sovereign. Like, I don't know all of the answers, but I know that I know, you know what I'm saying? And so I am being the, you know, the correlation that connects God and the ancestors and man you know, I am that I am. All of those things are relevant. But like, please, the moving in fear is a thing of the past. We're moving strong, solidly, bold, and conscientiously to build a better world than the world that we've been living in. And I'm ready for it. And I'm here for it. Yes, 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 indeed. Uh, unity is strength. Uh, and there is strength in unity. So let's keep on keeping on, family. And just like Baba Kaba says, it ain't over until we win. It yeah. ain't over until we win. Yeah. Uh, so thank you guys for coming out and for being patient and for hanging out with us tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I'll leave you as I greet you. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom, shalom. Hotep, Islam. Alafia. Peace. Peace.